Thanks for the invitation and the opportunity of uh, presenting my work as uh, uh, Dr. Chen has uh, introduced. Uh, I have been working on uh, AI and machine learning and especially uh, how they can be applied or help with healthcare. And uh, the title of my talk today is uh, AI for uh, Healthcare Disparities, a Double-Edged Sword. And uh, I'm sure everybody has here AI uh, from different places and uh, there are different kinds of definitions, but in short, so artificial intelligence by um, it's, uh, when it was proposed, I mean, its aim is, is to make the uh, machine, mainly uh, computers to think in a human way. Uh, and uh, machine learning as uh, although we heard a lot of times exchangeably with uh, artificial intelligence, but it is uh, actually uh, can be regarded as a subfield of AI and it is a way of implementing AI. And uh, there are also some subcategories of machine learning, like supervised learning, like a uh, lot of the times we build risk of prediction models. Uh, you train your uh, some sort of prediction model, which is essentially a mapping function from the input to some sort of label, let's say uh, have disease or no. Uh, I mean, and then you want to apply this model in the real setting where you don't know the actual label or the patients having disease or no, you use the model to do the prediction. So this is the kind of like the supervised learning setting. And the unsupervised learning setting is really kinds of like, you don't, there's no notion about the outcomes or prediction or uh, labels, but you really just have a set of samples. Let's say a set of patients all have COVID-19. And their clinical demonstration, demonstrations is really heterogeneous and you want to identify if there are coherent subgroups such that a set of patients have, uh, let's, uh, let's say respiratory problem, a set of patients have diabetes, a set of patients have cardiovascular problems. So you want to figure out the heterogeneity of the disease by just the grouping those patients according to their clinical demonstrations. And this is just a, like a, uh, using computational approaches to figure out the structure or the geometric characteristics of the uh, sample space. So, I mean, there's no really supervision or uh, uh, whatever outcomes is assessed. So this is unsupervised learning. And the last one is called reinforcement learning, which is really your thinking of making a sequence of decisions and you want to make your next decision based on your current patient, patient status. And reinforcement learning is becoming more and more popular, really stems from the, the you know, uh, Google's AlphaGo. You know, when you play a Go game, it's really a sequential decision process. You need to look at where your opponent, uh, is, uh, what, what he or she is doing to, to decide what you want to do as the next step to maximize the likelihood of your final winning. So you will see some uh, promising examples of all those different learning strategies in different scenarios in medicine. And of course, another term we hear a lot uh, is deep learning. And actually deep learning is just a one strategy of uh, uh, machine learning. And uh, it is uh, like in this case, you have a set of uh, uh, face images input, let's say your output or your targets to predict who is in the picture. Uh, so you're gonna feed all those images input into a series of transformations, which is a highly uh, non-linear and composed by a lot of uh, interconnected uh, these circles, which are usually referred to as uh, artificial neurons. And these neurons are actually, every of them are looking, I mean, like this. So you can see it is very similar to a logistic regression. So you essentially stack a whole set of uh, uh, logistic regressions layer by layer uh, and, and to, to achieve some complicated transformations to uh, get a high prediction accuracy. So this is a, kind of like the a basic idea of deep learning or deep art, uh, uh, artificial neural networks. Um, and uh, so uh, we have seen a lot of successes of deep learning in different areas, like uh, as uh, I just mentioned the AlphaGo, like the autonomous driving, the uh, Amazon Echo for a speech recognition for like a, a, a GPT-3, I mean, which is a more like a, a general artificial intelligence software program that can uh, do a lot of uh, uh, intelligent things. I mean, which is not really constrained sp to specific domain, but the techniques behind is really depends on some natural language processing, huge natural language processing model. So then people have been thinking about uh, whether these techniques can be uh, used for or applied 
in uh, modern uh, uh, medicine or healthcare. Of course, we have a lot of data around the patients, including like electronic health records, physiological signals, the videos, the dialogues, the bio uh, bi uh, biomedical literatures, the medical images and pharmaceutical research and development and so on and so forth. So this clearly poses a challenge um, like a, a, a data analysis because uh, they are highly heterogeneous and a large amount and so on and so forth. And I'm sure most of you have heard this term precision medicine when Francis Collins, who is a director of NIH proposed this idea of precision medicine. He has this uh, 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 com a commentary or perspective on New England Journal of Medicine. He specifically emphasized that this initiative will encourage and support the next generation of scientists to develop creative new approaches for detecting, measuring, and analyzing a wide range of biomedical information, including molecular genomic, cellular clinical, behavioral, physiological, and environmental factors. So it really poses a huge challenge by how can you effectively and efficiently integrate all those sorts of heterogeneous information to get a better understanding, really customized understanding to individual health status? So this clearly is a, is a computational challenge or technical challenge to conventional like computational models. Uh, so that's why these uh, uh, like deep learning or whatever uh, machine learning model could be, uh, could play an important role here. So uh, let's uh, first see some, uh, uh, I wouldn't say successful, but uh, promising examples on the application of AI slash machine learning in different medical scenarios. So the first uh, is of course COVID-19 and it caused a lot of problems even, even until now, I mean, the global pandemic. And uh, if you know, so the gold, the gold standard uh, that uh, people use for confirming COVID-19 is through this RT-PCR test. So in short, I'm not an expert on virus, but in short, so this process is really, I mean, they, 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 I mean, uh, uh, they did a nose swap to you and they got the, the, the RNA virus and uh, they first do this reverse transcription to make it double strain so that it can be replicated. And when the viral load uh, uh, in your body exceeds a certain amount through this replication process using this RT-PCR machine over several cycles, it kind of exceeds a certain threshold. The number of cycles, the CT value, kind of exceeds a certain threshold. And, and if uh, within a certain number of uh, uh, cycles, it exceeds a threshold, a threshold, then you're COVID positive, and otherwise you're COVID negative. So although a lot of times we only talk about uh, 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 the positive or negative as a kind of a just a binary uh, outcome from RT-PCR test, but you can, as you can see, actually, it is a continuous value. I mean, uh, the, the number of cycles that uh, that is needed for uh, replicating the, the virus to make it uh, be able to be detected, the CT value is usually referred to the viral load. And there are lots of research on trying to associate those viral loads with uh, clinical outcomes like mortality. But uh, there are some uh, uh, concerns like for the RT-PCR test, the one uh, significant one that's a uh, high, uh, a potentially high uh, uh, false negative rate like this, uh, 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 Har I mean, uh, Harlan uh, Krumpos pointed out in this New York Times piece. I mean, it is suspected that, uh, that there might be as, as, as much as 30% false negative rate for uh, RT-PCR tests. And there are some follow-up uh, academic uh, perspectives or articles pointed out uh, the, the potential concern. This is, of course, uh, at the initial like uh, uh, time of the pandemic in in U.S., like uh, uh, March, April last year in New York. So people raised these concerns. So uh, that false negative means that if you did the RT-PCR test that says the patient is negative, you let the patient go, but actually the patient could be positive. So it's gonna cause the spreading of the uh, uh, of the disease and. Uh, may lead to some, some uh, uh, not unwanted consequences. So then uh, by collaborating with uh, uh, the clinical lab, Madison here at New York 
uh, Presbyterian Hospital. So we are thinking of whether it is possible to build a competition model based on machine learning uh, to kind of like uh, as a, a, a supplementary tool to support the clinician's decisions on judging whether the patient is having an actual source cov to infection or no. So here's uh, our uh, pipeline by using the, uh, this is uh, using the data from March, April last year for the patient who took RT-PCR test uh, at New York Presbyterian Hospital. And uh, so we actually take uh, the routine blood because these patients, when they are testing for RT-PCR, they typically gonna take a set of associated routine blood tests as well to test the abnormality, potential abnormalities of other uh, 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 testing. Uh, and uh, so we collected the uh, routine blood tests uh, of uh, the patient within two days before he or she took the RT-PCR test. And then we form a vector representation with, uh, of the patient with every dimension representing a particular uh, routine blood test like the, the, the white blood cell count, the neutrophil, lymphocyte, ferritin, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then because the patient, all the patient, they actually also took RT-PCR RT test so we can see whether those uh, routine blood test profile can be predict predictive of the actual RT-PCR result. And we use a, uh, 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 ensemble model called the gradient boosting decision tree. And uh, this is kind of like the result. So we can see uh, it achieves actually a fairly uh, a good prediction accuracy in terms of uh, uh, like uh, uh, areas under the curve, sensitivity, specificity, and so on and so forth. So uh, this means that, I mean, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, routine blood test, the profiles captured within two days before the actual RT-PCR tests are, is actually indicative or predictive of the actual SARS-CoV-2 infection status. And more interestingly, uh, this model can also capture some of the false negatives, which is one of the motivation why, why we want to do this. Like in this case, I mean, our model predicts this patient is having a 0.95 probability of having a um, actual SARS-CoV-2 infection. So which means that the patient is highly likely to be a COVID-19 positive, but uh, the, the, the RT-PCR result for this patient is negative. And then, our, I mean, not only we can produce a number, we can also produce a set of uh, uh, interpretations which are shown in those uh, uh, red bars, which are the contributing factors on why this model think uh, this patient is having a high probability of having an actual uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection status. And then actually uh, by checking the patient records, the patient com was coming back to the clinic within two days after this test and his uh, or her uh, testing RT-PCR testing result turned to be positive, which, which means that the previous negative result is actually uh, a false negative. And uh, this, uh, this model is having a high potential to be uh, helpful for clinical decision support, especially for confirming the COVID-19 testing. And it, has, it was reported by lots of media, like the modern healthcare as an example. And that, this is just an example on like uh, electronic health records. And uh, people have also been uh, trying to use machine learning or artificial intelligence to do image analysis. Like this is a cell paper. Uh, they are trying to uh, build a machine learning model to analyze uh, the patient along uh, CT scans and with the hope to identify if the patient is having a, a COVID-19 positive, uh, number one, number two is how severe is that. And the one key uh, capability of their algorithm is they can do automatic segmentation and then identify the potential problematic area that can be indicative of the COVID-19, like in this case, these ground glass opacities and uh, consolidation shadows. And you can see, uh, I mean, the first column is really the original CT image. The second column is a manually segmented image, as you can see. Uh, if you ask the domain expert or the radiologist to segment this um, by hand, it's going to take a lot of time. Uh, and also the third column is the algorithm generated uh, segmented result. You can see there is a high uh, agreement between the second column and the third column, which uh, is an, another example showing the great potential of AI. So it can reduce a lot of uh, burden of uh, radiologists. 
And also there is another paper, which is uh, one of the earliest paper on AI for medicine that published on Nature Journals. I, I mean, on major journals. So this is actually a cover article of Nature where a set of Stanford folks, they try to build a machine learning model to basically, let's say you're given a skin lesion image, the model can tell you if this lesion is likely to be a malignant or benign. And this is actually the model. And I can tell you the model has 24 million parameters to make the judgment. And they compare the model's performance uh, with uh, several board certified dermatologists, which are really a trained a domain expert that uh, to do this classification and this model uh, can achieve a similar level of performance uh, with, uh, uh, I mean, as these uh, uh, domain experts. Um, so, and uh, uh, all those, I mean, the previous examples are like in the supervised learning setting where we really build a prediction or classification model to judge if this patient is having a, actual COVID-19 or uh, the, the COVID-19 severity or uh, 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 skin lesion, I mean, uh, uh, skin cancer or no. And uh, as I said, there are other uh, uh, machine learning uh, 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 types like uh, in this work, uh, we are trying to like uh, predict if, this, uh, if a patient is really uh, having a mild cognitive impairment, uh, which is uh, uh, a fairly a prevalent condition and it is a, uh, a kind of like a prodromal pro stage for uh, Alzheimer's for patients with Alzheimer's disease or dementia. So this is kind of like a conceptual graph on the uh, cognitive decline for uh, the patients with uh, uh, dementia or Alzheimer's disease compared to the patient's uh, cognitive de decline of, uh, because of normal aging. So we can see uh, uh, how, uh, how different uh, in terms of the uh, decline speed. So if we can identify, if there is a chance that we can identify a uh, mild cognitive impairment at early stage, there might be uh, interventions that uh, uh, can take place and uh, there is a better chance to slow down the progression, benefit the patients. But unfortunately, uh, currently, I mean, in order to confirm the patients having cognitive problems, typically you need either like a, a, a neural image or, or you need to take like a, a, a biomarker test from this, uh, a cerebral spinal fluid. So both procedures are pretty invasive to the patients. And then so we are thinking of um, like, uh, this is a work in collaboration with uh, Oregon Health and Science University have a big trial. So, I mean, th I mean the, the clinicians have, or uh, we also have observation if you talk with patient with cognitive problem. So when you talk to them a lot of the times, it's very difficult to figure out what they're talking about, which means that there is a chance by looking at the actual dialogue uh, or the script, uh, like what the patient is talking about to uh, to judge if this patient is actually having an MCI problem or no. So this uh, clearly uh, is a kind of like a dialogue based uh, uh, procedure, and it is uh, 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 of course very friendly to the patients, and much more uh, accessible. So um, with this idea, so we uh, build a, a conversational agent or a chatbot. Uh, based on reinforcement learning. So with, uh, as I said, our cl uh, uh, clinical collaborator has a large trial. So we leverage the, uh, the conversations or the dialogue uh, from that trial to train a conversational agent uh, using reinforcement learning. So the goal is to every, every round, the, the, the chatbot is going to ask the patient a question uh, from a set of question list. And the goal is to, and, and, and the chatbot is going to choose or determine. So what is a, a, a good next question to ask with the goal of uh, 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 make a decision that this patient is actually having a cognitive problem or no with least number of conversational rounds. And um, so, so uh, 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 this is a result like the horizontal axis of these uh, figures are the number of conversation, conversational rounds and vertical uh, axis means uh, the performance measure in terms of the classica uh, classification performance uh, uh, measured by different quantities. As you can see from, uh, with uh, uh, typically 15 to 20 
uh, 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 conversation runs, uh, the model can make a pretty good decision uh, in terms of the uh, uh, prediction, uh, I mean, uh, classification accuracy reflected by all those um, uh, quantities. So, I mean, all these are uh, a great uh, example showing the great potential of AI in medicine. Uh, and actually other than these uh, quantitative or you, you make these things more accurate. So another uh, benefit people have been thinking of AI that uh, may bring to medicine is uh, because all those AI uh, algorithms are uh, uh, you know uh, uh, based on or trained on object of patient data, so there might be chance that uh, they are less uh, sensitive to subjective bias, uh, so which means that can to a certain extent alleviate uh, the, the potential disparity of uh, healthcare decisions. And actually, this is what this nature medicine uh, showed. Uh, and actually what they, they were trying to investigate is this potential disparity of knee pain. And we, uh, I mean, it is uh, widely studied some of this joint pain or joint replacement therapy. I mean, there is a high disparity that this kind of uh, treatment is more likely to be uh, given to white patients than black patients. And uh, what this uh, 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 fig uh, figure does is uh, actually uh, I mean, what this work does is actually with uh, uh, the, the uh, 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 X-ray of the joints. So the uh, 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 um, clinician can give some uh, scores about whether uh, these, uh, uh, what is the grade or the severity of these uh, joints and uh, are they predictive of the actual pain of the patient, which is uh, 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 reported by the patient uh, as uh, Ku's uh, point scores. And, and they found that, uh, I mean, they, they build some uh, uh, regression model by in, uh, incorporating uh, some uh, factors that can lead to disparities like the race, income, and, and education. And they find that even by adjusting these uh, uh, clinician given uh, grading scores, uh, you still observe a large algorithm disparity uh, measured by the contribution. Actually, in this case, it's a coefficient when you make the linear regression model. It's a coefficient on the race and income and education. And, and uh, as a, a, a comparison, they build a deep learning model, which regressed directly from the raw uh, joint image to the um, uh, uh, cool points. And then they use that algorithm to predict uh, some sort of score. And they also adjust it based on that score. And they find that with uh, that uh, machine learning model generated score, uh, the they can actually uh, uh, reduce uh, uh, the, uh, I mean, the disparity by like uh, 4.7, 2.0, and uh, uh, 3.6 times. So that means that these AI algorithm can actually help, uh, I mean, to a certain extent, as we expected. And then there are also some concerns on like, because these uh, algorithms are uh, trained um, on uh, uh, patient data. So what if there, there are some problems like the quality issues or the potential bias of the, uh, uh, of the patient data? You, you train your algorithm on the, on the data. Lots of times people talk about garbage in, garbage out, but in this case would be the bias in the data gonna be exaggerated uh, by the model trained on top of that. So this is actually, uh, there is another science paper uh, in 2019 talks about uh, like, uh, um, I don't know why I have these yellow strokes. Anyway, so so um, they have this uh, a science paper talking about, I mean, there is a widely used algorithm by the insurance industry uh, to determine the eligibility of certain patients to a specific healthcare pro uh, program, a uh, management program, and they use the factors uh, like uh, these A, B, C, D, E, F are the factors captured in the last year to predict their eligible, their potential healthcare expenditure this year and use that to determine if the patient is uh, going to be eligible to the program or no. And these authors uh, uh, find out that uh, in order to make the patient eligible to the program, uh, for Black patients, they have to be much sicker compared to the white patient. And this figure, it shows uh, uh, the sickness, a patient sickness by the number of uh, 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 active chronic conditions in this case. And they also do some uh, fine-grained uh, 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 
uh, investigations like in this case, the hypertension and diabetes all suggest that uh, uh, in order to make the patient eligible, the black patient needs to be in a more severe stage than the white patient. So there is a, a pretty clear disparity there. If you use this model to do the, uh, 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 to make the decision. Uh, and uh, so, so this is just one example. And actually the cause is because they use a healthcare expenditure last year as a big predictor of uh, 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 this year. And that expenditure it, itself has some inherent disparities uh, in it. So that's uh, that's a problem in the, in the data. And if you build a model on top of the data, it's kind of exaggerated by the model. And actually there are some uh, also other uh, um, uh, 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 works like in this case would be like the dermatology example I gave you. So you use, you train a model on top of a set of, uh, uh, based on a set of skin lesions and you do the classification. But what if your lesion image is all captured from white people? So you cannot expect the model is going to work well for uh, uh, people with skin colors. So these are all potential biases, uh, uh, I mean, existing in the data. Uh, and then, so there are, so people have been uh, studying like, uh, is there any, uh, possibilities that uh, we can adjust uh, these models to make them fair because we now we are aware of these problems before we don't know but now we are aware of the uh, potential problem these uh, algorithm may produce so can we adjust for them so this, this is another paper uh, talking about let's say we build a predictive model based on the claims data in this case uh, and we want to predict if a uh, 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 a patient's uh, more likely to have a postpartum depression or no. Uh, and they compare like a, a different uh, adjustment mechanism in this case. Uh, uh, I mean, they, they, they tested uh, uh, three, I will show you later, uh, different mechanisms. And these are just a set of terms people talk a lot because in order to, uh, to say or to uh, measure that these, these adjustments work or no, you need to first uh, quantify uh, the disparity, and then you, I mean, let's say after your adjustment model, like reduce the quantity, then you can say it reduce uh, uh, the, the, the algorithm disparity. So these are all the kind of like the mathematical concept on how would you define like the different types of fairness and how can you uh, calculate the disparity. Uh, and uh, I mean, as quantities, and this is the data they use in the, uh, in the, uh, 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 paper and they use this as a uh, fragment women enrolled in Medicaid from 2014 to 2018 and uh, some summary statistics of the patients from which you can clearly see the likelihood for the white female to suffer from uh, mental health problems uh, or um, uh, uh, postpartum depression is uh, uh, much bigger than uh, black women. And then they, uh, as I said, so they uh, uh, investigated uh, uh, different uh, model adjustment mechanism to see if the, dis uh, the algorithm disparity can be reduced. Uh, like, uh, I mean, these, uh, these are two figures uh, demonstrating uh, the effect the effectiveness of these uh, adjustment mechanism measure uh, based on different uh, disparity measures. So A is a, a disparate impact where uh, you look at if uh, the, the, the bar or the value is closer to one, which means that because it's a ratio uh, is indicating a fair, a more fair algorithm while the equal opp opportunity difference because it's a difference. So the, the closer the value, uh, to zero indicates the algorithm is more fair. So from this, we can see actually with these model adjustments, uh, it, it, uh, quantitatively, uh, I mean, it indeed leads to more fair decisions, uh, but for different adjustment mechanism, uh, the, 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 their effectiveness might differ, at least in this case. And then, so, uh, so now we know like uh, for, uh, there might be potential bias in the data, which leads to a bad model, not really bad model, but disparate model. And then we want to adjust them. And now we can see adjustment works. Then an associate question is, we do these modeling for accuracy. We want